Hello, everyone. Hello, James. Hello, Nikolaus. Uh, hello, dear participants. It's very good to have you in our session today on third party funding. Thank you very much for joining. We will discuss uh, third party funding in pandemic times, which is one of the most hot issue nowadays. It became uh, recently very popular starting, I think, from 2015, 2016, and especially this year because of all coronavirus restrictions, lockdowns, and respective negative consequences, this topic became even more appealing to all actors involved, in-house lawyers, funders, and professional consultants. And it is my pleasure to join, uh, to host this session today with my esteemed co-panelists. I would like to introduce James Mans, uh, my good friend who is senior litigation expert at Gormandia Transportation. Uh, he studied in the United States and obtained a JD degree from George Washington University Law School. He worked at Sherman Sterling in New York and Schellenberg Whitmer in Switzerland. And he also served as Deputy, Deputy Secretary General and Head of Case Management at German Arbitration Institute, so-called DIS. He combines extensive experience as external counsel, Head of Case Management of DIS, and as in-house attorney and cross-board dispute resolution. James acted as arbitrator and counsel in many cases, and he is actually active speaker on third-party funding. And if I'm not mistaken, James, you had just recently spoke last week on this issue uh, in some another webinar, which again proves uh, how interesting this topic is and how it's important. And today, James will definitely share with us his insights on third-party funding uh, from pure in-house uh, lawyer perspective. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Sergey. I really appreciate the kind words. Um, uh, yes, there was an in-house event on this. And actually, I think it does show that uh, interest in this topic is growing and awareness is growing uh, among companies and also corporate users, not just the, the traditional users, let's say, of, of third-party funding. Um, let me introduce uh, Nikolaus Petkovic, the second uh, moderator of today's workshop. Um, Nikolaus is a founding partner and head of um, Graf and Petkovic, uh, the dispute resolution firm uh, well known uh, in Austria. He heads the dispute resolution and real estate practice groups. He's been practicing uh, for a number of years with a strong international focus, also a focus on Central and Eastern Europe. Um, as well as transactional work in real estate and M&A. He's certainly one of the most well-known Austrian dispute resolution practitioners, having acted as counsel and an arbitrator in a number of arbitrations. Um, and um, he uh, uh, has also, and that's, I think, uh, one of the, we're fortunate to have him here today. He's a real expert on the topic of, of third-party funding. And of course, he's well-known to many of you um, as a regular contributor to ABA projects, but his expertise in third-party funding um, uh, is deep and he is the author of a handbook on third-party funding that uh, appeared in 2018 and from what I can see uh, covers pretty much every aspect of this topic, so we're very fortunate to have him here uh, and I look forward to this joint uh, workshop with you, Sergei and, and Nikolaus. Thank you very much, James, um, also for advertising the handbook. And um, I have now the honor of introducing uh, Sergey, um, who is actually the master of ceremony today because he's in full control over all the Zoom commands. So um, he's the one, if you're, not, if you're not able to be heard, uh, you have to send him a, a message. Um, so uh, Sergey Morozov is counsel at the International Center for legal protection. Uh, that's a task force created uh, to defend the Russian Federation's interest in international arbitrations and court proceedings um, abroad. And they are best known for their role in the Yukos case. Uh, Sergei is admitted to practice in Russia and in New York. He specializes um, in complex uh, cross-border dispute in international commercial investment arbitration and he's certainly an outstanding international arbitration expert with a brilliant uh, pedigree. He was educated at Lomosov Moscow State University. Uh, he was educated at Pepperdine University International Corporate, 
called International Co Commercial Arbitration and the International Academy for Arbitration Law in Paris. Uh, he's gained work experience in a major law firm in for over eight years working at their Moscow offices and he's gained experience working for Washington DC office and now he um, acts as uh, both counsel arbitrator in proceeding state court uh, and arbitration proceedings virtually all around the world uh, engaging top-notch legal teams all around the world. So with that I hand over to you Sergey to give us some general and technical guidance for this session. Thank you very much, Nikolaus. Thank you very much, James. Um, I, I, yes, uh, we have some small ground rules for this today's session. So basically, it's coffee shop session. It's not a lecture. It's a live discussion. And we encourage you, first of all, to share your views, to share your experience, because we notice there are many funders actually uh, signed for, for this conference, for this session. Please ask your questions. You can do it uh, either by raising your hand uh, in the function like uh, button below, or you can use the chat function. And I already noticed that someone from Dubai, I think, already asked some questions. Uh, that's nice. Uh, thank you very much for your questions, which you submitted before, before the session. Uh, so just please don't interrupt the uh, speaker, and the speaker will notice your hand or your question in the chat. and afterwards uh, he will give you the floor he will invite you to ask your question and to share your views of course what is said today uh, stays here and all the views are not necessarily uh, our personal views or that of our institutions and please know that the session is recorded and is uploaded to youtube so basically we'll start with the introduction and uh, then expected upturn in recourse to third party funding then james will talk uh, about choosing the right funder and Nikolaus explained to us the differences in different models uh, of funding agreements and I will conclude with the security for costs and some third-party funding developments nowadays. So thank you very much Nikolaus, the floor is yours. So the baby third-party funding, as uh, many have seen it maybe five, six years ago, has, in, has really grown up and it has grown up immensely fast. It has developed and it has already offsprings. We see an increasing relevance of third-party funding. More funders are entering the market, larger sums are being invested. Um, the arbitral institutions, they have um, in turn um, one by one started to address and they're still contemplating how to best address third-party funding in their rules. Um, there appears to be a trend uh, toward disclosure of the existence of third-party funding and also the name of the funder uh, and perhaps even more to come. I'm just uh, referring to the Hong Kong arbitration rules, the exit um, proposed amendments, the Milan rules, the CTAG rules, um, so there is uh, a lot of development and there is further business on the horizon for funders. One we'll address today is, is the COVID situation, but um, just being from the European Union, I just want to remind you or refer to you that the EU just uh, released very shortly ago is a uh, directive on class actions, uh, which will certainly um, generate uh, business for funders. We also see uh, a lot of new developments and reasons for debate and also potential concerns. Uh, without going into details, I just want to address uh, the regulations which have been implemented in Hong Kong and in Singapore and most recently also um, in Australia and also the much discussed uh, Burford Muddy Waters case. So there is uh, a lot of discussion and the, this, debate uh, on, on the floor. And with that uh, short intro, I hand over to James to set off to our first topic for discussion. Thank you very much, Nikolaus, uh, for this overview. And uh, the first topic we wanted to discuss with you, and again, discuss not a me lecture, is, um, uh, and so we really welcome interventions in the, in the chat or also, by the way, uh, oral interventions, because we can then basically unmute you and let you speak up. Um, 
the first question we had is it's really COVID specific. It is, would, will COVID or will the pandemic result in more uh, third party funding or more recourse? Um, and there are really a number of reasons why that could be the case. First, um, the, an increase in the number of disputes themselves related to the pandemic. Uh, everyone has received, at least if you're in-house, dozens of force majeure memos. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that's actually already translated into cases. But as we know from previous crises, uh, there could be all kinds of uh, litigation arising out of this situation. So will, will third party funding become more important because of that increase? The second, maybe more specific to the funding is the liquidity crisis that some companies may be experiencing as a result of the crisis. Uh, to what extent does that does that push them toward um, TPF uh, um, for the first time, perhaps in their corporate lives, um, and uh, maybe um, more immediately, uh, many cases may have been either delayed or disrupted um, because of extension of deadlines or a change of hearings. Um, will that um, additional time, which translates into additional um, liquidity need or cash cash need, uh, will that perhaps uh, translate into additional uh, the use of, of uh, TPF? And finally, the uh, uh, increase in insolvencies that we're expecting and the increase in, in, in cash constraint might also have um, uh, result in lesser voluntary compliance with ARTL awards. To what extent will we see more TPF uh, at the enforcement stage. So that's really laying a little bit the groundwork or the, the basis for this question. Do we, are we already seeing more? Do we expect to see more? And I'd love to hear from uh, people on the call, especially on, uh, of course, companies, but also other practitioners. And if I um, if I don't, or if you are, would like to think about this a little bit, uh, maybe I'll th um, I'll pass uh, to Nicolaus and Sergey for their initial reaction. Have you seen um, more inquiries? Have clients approached you? Have you uh, seen more activity on the funder side? What's your uh, view at this stage? I, we're relatively early into this. I mean, I, I don't think there's been any adjudicated cases, for example, on the pandemic. But uh, what do you where do you see this? Um, we, we see an increase. Uh, we, we definitely see that uh, with uh, financial constraints, uh, more and more companies are thinking how to finance their litigations. Uh, we also see um, on the side of third party funders some concern because the financial distress may not only hit uh, the claimant but also the respondent and uh, uh, what third party funders typically do is they also look at um, the outcome of the proceedings. So if the respondent, uh, the target is impecunious, that may also affect the situation. So um, we see an interest, um, third party funders are, <coughs> uh, there are different types of third party funders around who are looking for different types of cases and some may not be necessarily happy with the cases being brought to them is as a result of that situation but generally there is more business out there okay yes, thank you Nicolas. thank you, thank you Jay. Jay. Nicolas. yeah well, i would also would like to add that recently i think last week uh in washington dc the new international legal finance Association was launched uh, which combines, I think, of Burford Capital, Harbor Litigation Funding, Long for Capital Management, and some other funders. Uh, and uh, reportedly, they're saying that they control around 10 billion United States dollars uh, in financing to uh, poten potential claim holders. So, in any case, I think there is definitely uh, increased activity. Uh, on the side of funders and uh, to be honest, I think uh, after some uh, easing of the restrictions uh, when we see possible first uh, after Corona claims, we'll have uh, increased demand also from investors, real or fake, but still I think there will be an issue. Okay. Do we see um, uh, do we see any reaction from the audience at this stage? Do we have any contributions 
uh, from your experience or impressions that either match or, or maybe are a little bit different from those that Sergei and Nikolaus have shared? I think we have a question from Jacob Hubert that he can add a, an example. So would you like to be unmuted, Jacob? Okay, you're now live. So, Jacob, fortunately, I not. can see you, but I cannot hear you, Jacob. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes. you. You can hear me now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Just. Uh, uh, I just want to add a, uh, an experience uh, from within, so to speak, so a funder's experience. Uh, over the last couple of months, uh, we have seen um, quite an uptake of uh, COVID-related cases. And I just want to add one person, one, one experience, or one case where uh, at the very start of the COVID situation, we were approached by a, a large um, company uh, from the aviation industry and we were approached by the general counsel who said that the CEO has basically said and that uh, the, the legal department is not supposed to spend any money on, on its cases anymore. So basically <laughs> they were uh, left in a situation where they had all these ongoing cases but they could not spend any money uh, on these cases anymore. And the request there was uh, whether we as a funder could just take basically all these cases as a portfolio uh, on into, into our caseload and could finance these cases, be it uh, active cases where the funder funds the, the claimant or be it uh, passive cases where the defendant is then being funded. This is just uh, one example of uh, many uh, COVID-related cases that we see that I wanted to share. Thank you. Well, that's very interesting, uh, Jakob. Thank you very much. And it actually confirms um, both elements of, of our proposition. First, the increase in the total number of cases due to COVID, and the second, then uh, 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 the increase in funding because of uh, cash, cash constraints. Um, uh, I can certainly say from uh, from the uh, previous webinar with uh, with some in-house counsel that the impression is that uh, uh, that the, the, the cash constraint is a strong is a strong factor for companies to at least look at this uh, tool um, and I think um, I think this may be um, it's really a bit of an education you need to be aware of it whether it's always the right tool uh, that's something that you have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis So I was just checking the chat, but Sergey, maybe you have a better view on it, but I don't see any other uh, question at this stage. So if you're fine, we can move on to the next topic. Yes, thank you, James. I think there is still a question from Jamal that he's looking for a third party funder. I yes. think we, we have some possible candidates and they can chat privately, but no, no other questions at this stage. Okay. No, absolutely. and. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that uh, the, the, I'm not sure if the funders are seeing this message, but I'm sure they'd be happy to connect. So um, the, the next topic is, um, and again, we're trying to focus this on COVID. So the next topic is choosing the right funder. Um, choosing the right funder, maybe by way of sort of general introduction, um, it's a, a very complex topic if you haven't done it before. Um, and uh, I refer to a uh, checklist that the uh, ICA put out, I think two years ago, um, that has uh, uh, lots of criteria. There's a full report on third-party funders. And at the end of the report, there's a checklist, uh, whether it's publicly listed, what's the, uh, um, uh, are there conflicts of interest, things like that. Um, more, more immediately, perhaps, the choice of the right funder, I think, is is very case uh, specific. Um, I, think what's I think what's important is that the advantages of TPF are reflected in the funder and that the disadvantages 
um, uh, are minimized in that choice. I think that would be my my guiding principle. Um, what does that mean? Well, some of the advantages are obviously the um, the fact that you get a second opinion. Now, if you don't get to if you don't get to see that opinion at all, or if you don't get to talk to the funder very much about that opinion, that that benefit is obviously diminished in the event that the funder declines. Um, the second element is is really having a free uh, and and uh, unfettered litigation counsel who can operate together with the council. So choosing the right funder is someone who is a team player. Uh, and vice versa too. The, the litigation council needs to be aware of this instrument and needs to work well together. Um, settlement is always an option for companies. I think it's an important element of any dispute resolution strategy to look out for for ideal solutions, for win-win solutions. And so the funding arrangement, the funder should be someone who understands that and who supports that and doesn't stand in the way of it. Uh, and so I think beyond the checklist, which I think is very helpful, especially to um, people and companies like mine that are not experienced with this tool very much. Um, I think uh, it's important to look at what you want to get out of the, the funder and to what extent does the funder actually reflect uh, those goals. Um, but how could this be now impacted by, by COVID? So I think uh, we've, we've thought about uh, different, uh, different uh, reasons why COVID would have an impact on the choice. One is of course the, um, the cash flow situation on the, on the funder side. So um, to what extent has COVID impacted the funders? I think this is something that would have to be part of the conversation uh, at the beginning. Uh, in other words, will the funder be uh, able to put up the capital now and in the next two or three years, which is how long the arbitration tends to go? Um, here, I'd also be very interested in Nikolaus's and Sergei's uh, reactions. Uh, to what extent, I mean, companies, funders are companies as well, obviously. To what extent have the financial markets been impacted, have the funders been impacted? My, my guess would be perhaps not that much. Uh, money is cheap, uh, but to what extent um, have, have may they have been uh, affected by the crisis so that the COVID now puts additional due diligence burden on, on council and on companies? If I can just, um, before addressing it, just make a general uh, comment. Finding the right funder, as we see from the comments from Jamal is, is uh, on, on the chat is something which is not so easy because there's no transparent funders market and there are uh, that creates a problem and there are um, for all of you who do not know there are brokers out there um, who are sort of uh, selecting funders and uh, preparing the case for the adequate funder so that's one thing which is out there and there are more and more now directories uh, which show uh, specific funders, chambers even have a has a distinct section for funders, but ultimately it's a not so transparent market that has been changed as we know, as, as we already heard to the um, first uh, UK and now international um, started association of, of major funders, but it's still not so easy to really find the right funder for the right case because some funders have appetites for different types of cases. Now, what we see now with the um, disclosures coming up uh, for funders, uh, they're no longer in the background. Uh, they have to be disclosed and they're also getting subject um, to attacks by the opponent. Um, and that is another reason why we see much more due diligence of the party seeking funding prior to uh, the funding. So they're looking very carefully at the funder to make sure that the funder is also um, can be um, resistant to any potential attacks from the opponent, but also to make sure that the, the funder is sufficiently um, financed. Uh, so that's what we see now as a result of the development of the market, but also of the COVID crisis. With that handing over to Sergey. Yes, thank you, James. Thank you, Nicolaus. I support your ideas and views which, which were uh, expressed. So basically what, what we see now, uh, the market is growing, or the market of funders is growing, and we see the streamlined process of unifying the market because the funders are now not acting just, you know, it, had, it happened before five years ago in the wild, wild west, but now they're uh, organizing some kind of associations and they try to you know make 
uh, the approach is similar to to the uh, to the to the parties which they fund, and to to the context from both in-house and external side. Uh, so recently, we also seen that, for example, uh, Law 360 reporting that uh, funders uh, did pretty well before the pandemic. So they reported that each major funder uh, from these six uh, so-called magic circle of funders had around uh, 100 up to 200 million uh, dollars on their just accounts as cash and they also have some perspective funding up to I think seven, 700 million or even more uh, from various organizations or from various institutions. So basically they're doing pretty well and as in any case uh, just choosing the right provider for you should definitely uh, inquire about the financial position of the funder itself, which is also relevant, of course, to the issue of the costs, which we deal later. Okay, so James, pass the floor. Let me, yeah, let me ask maybe one more question, uh, because I was intrigued by this idea of, of challenges on the funder. Um, to what extent, Nicolas Sergei, uh, is there already precedent or even, or experience on, on what tribunals are willing to request or to require? especially in connection with the uh, security for costs applications. What, what does the funder have to show or disclose in respect of its financial uh, standing? That's a very good question, James, with regard to the disclosure, because it's one of the uh, uh, main problem with the third party funding arrangements, because uh, as soon as you disclose that you have a funder, uh, the next step probably from the opposing side will be the filing of uh, application for security for costs. And in, in, in any case, this make it very complex to decide what kind of information could be provided to the opposing counsel, for example, if you have a funder, and to what extent uh, the arrangements, the provisions of the contract with the funder could be, could be disclosed. Uh, Nikolaus, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I have not heard of any uh, recent example of uh, reimbursement of costs from the funder itself, but nobody knows. Yeah, I mean, what, what we have um, seen uh, more often come up is, is, is uh, two types of cases. One is where uh, there have been questions raised as to the background of the funds of the funder. Um, so. Uh, uh, just uh, mentioning so anti-money laundering and other issues where the funder would have to be required to be disclosing funds and so that it, it's its background that has been one attack uh, launched and the other attack launched has been uh, to attempt to find um, to, to get a adequate security for cost in case of adverse cost. Uh, there has been case law, particularly in, in Germany, um, that if a uh, financing is not, the adverse costs are not uh, adequately secured, um, that it's not appropriate to continue the claim. That's case law in class actions uh, where there has there is a need and which have been, which we've also seen arbitrations where there's been the need to put up uh, adverse cost um, in by means of a bank guarantee or by cash, uh, just to assure that this is indeed payable. Okay, thank you very much, Sergei Nikolaus. Um, now would be a good time, um, ladies and gentlemen, for the audience to intervene. Speak up, please. Um, Jakob led by example, so it's easy. If there are any questions or contributions on the impact on the funders from COVID. Okay, that actually, so I'm not sure, Sege, if you see something that I don't see, but I don't see any contributions in the chat at this stage, um, which is fine. We have uh, three more topics to talk about. So if there is no- I a question to the audience because I've noticed from uh, the list of participants that we have some representative from Russian funders actually, uh, which is not quite common. So, in case mm -hmm. you have some uh, experience or ideas how Corona changed the process of the parties approaching you and choosing the funder from the Russian market? 
I've seen, I, I, I think, Platforma, founder company, or maybe some other. Okay. Maybe they're still thinking about the question, so let's Absolutely. move forward. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next topic. And uh, Nikolaus, um, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, the next topic is the funding agreement. Funding um, is now uh, sort of getting more and more around. And now the question arises, what is the nature? And this is something which I wanted to discuss with you before we go into the details of the funding agreement. What's the nature of the funding agreement? What's the background of the funding agreement? Because the legal nature of the funding agreement um, is there is a lot of dispute and discussion around it, uh, apart from the um, legal validity, but also from the legal consequences arising out of it. And uh, we have uh, prepared a poll for you uh, where we have uh, given you six options and we want you um, to uh, choose one, what you think is the most likely nature of the funding um, agreement. So um, can I ask Sergey as our master of ceremony to put up this poll now so that you can all, all see it and I'll just walk you through that. Um, so the first option is, is the funding agreement, the loan agreement. After all, you're getting some money, you don't get security. Um, the security is sort of a future interest, but um, you're getting as a result of the funding, uh, there is a uh, loan factor. Then the second one is a partnership. Um, the the um, Austrian law, which I'm familiar with, has this concept of a silent partnership where a partner doesn't have a say. He must be silent. So that's why I'm calling it a partnership. The third one is a purchase of receivables, uh, which could also be um, an option to buy a, a receivable, a certain claim. Um, the um, next one is bet um, a wager. Um, you're taking your chances as a funder and you, um, it's a luck agreement. It's a gaming related contract. The next one is insurance. I see quite a few votes as to insurance uh, because after all you're insuring uh, sort of the, uh, you've, uh, it's, it's a premium you pay. Is it a premium uh, for a certain outcome? And the last one is a contract of its own type. So um, we have uh, nine out of 22 votes uh, who have been uh, passed. So I invite you all to, vote. Uh, I think the votes, uh, but Sergei, correct me, are anonymous. So you, your name is not <laughs> represented in the outcome. So uh, feel free to choose any uh, of, the, of, of the legal concept. And I think the concept does have consequences because if you, for example, if you define third party funding as a contract, uh, you have a warranty uh, and representations which which the seller of the claim hands over to the buyer, to the third party funder. And that's an entirely different legal concept than a partnership where there are mutual obligations and responsibilities. And um, of course, um, what I think uh, is important is that third party funding um, can also be uh, the contract uh, certainly depends also on the regulation in the um, or the contract type depends on the wording of the contract. Uh, so if the parties had it uh, purchase contract and they contain all the clauses of a uh, purchase, it may be rather a purchase contract, but that's again sub subject to different legal systems. Um, so we now have 12 out of 22. Uh, we're waiting, getting some more. So we got some bets. Uh, that's good to see. Um, my personal um, really theory or, uh, is that the third party funding is an investment in law firms. You're investing not only in the claim, you're investing primarily in a law firm, the law firm which is pursuing a claim on your behalf. And I think that's one of the essential elements all third party funders are also looking at is the law firm that is pursuing the claim the one who's capable of, of doing it. So that's also a sort of indirect investment that's not taken here in the poll. So we have that and I now open the floor uh, to debate and discussion on the third party funding. And um, I 
Um, I would ask Sergey. I, I see the result on the screen. I don't know if everybody sees the result on the screen, but uh, can Sergey put it on the screen now? Yes, now I think all participants can see the result that loan agreement is the most favored option. The second one is purchase of receivables and uh, mixed contract. So that exactly uh, demonstrates uh, the example I wanted to make that it's, it's a lot of uncertainty. Nobody really knows and there is uh, at least in, in, in my part of the world, Austria and also looking at Germany, there's very little case law on that and there is also only limited literature and the disputed views. So anybody wants to have a comment on that and has a question on the contract type and the nature of the third party funding. So if, uh, does, so I hand over to James and Sergey if they want to um, add their views on that. Yes. Well, go ahead, Sergey. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks, thanks, James. Uh, Nikolaus, yeah, indeed, the form of uh, and the legal nature of the funding agreement is, I think, one of the most crucial topic uh, in this field because when I think published one of the first articles on third party third party funding two years ago. I had lots of uh, emails and invitations from actual Russian funders to help them uh, and to discuss the possible model of this engagement because uh, there was a long debate uh, in the Russian uh, court practice, in the Russian court acts, uh, whether such models are allowed or not, uh, like the same, we, uh, there, there, there are the same in the United States or uh, in Europe. And uh, basically what we were looking for, we were trying to fix and trying to fit the economic construction of third party funding into the existing uh, legal contractual models. And it was quite a challenging task because uh, specific nature of third party funding sometimes just doesn't allow it, you know, uh, to lie within this specific form of, for example, loan agreement or insurance contract. And of course, we can just say that at the end, it's a mixed contract, uh, sui generis. And uh, of course, there is the same concept in the Russian civil law. But what's uh, important here, uh, just two questions. First, uh, how uh, the funded party will be able to actually receive funding in case, for example, of breach of contract on the funder side. And uh, secondly, how the funder can easily obtain the proceeds from a successful trial and can receive the outcome without any negative, uh, especially tax or uh, anti-money laundering uh, statutes, because this is a really crucial issue nowadays uh, in the Russian legal system. Thank you. Um, James, anything to add? Well, one question I would have or contribution, I know some funders um, uh, advertise with uh, the fact that they have obtained clearance from the financial regulatory authority in their respective jurisdiction on, on whatever model they're proposing. And so I would be curious, um, are you aware of, uh, of funders that have um, that, that managed to do that across different countries? Uh, uh, and, and maybe more importantly, um, does the qualification of the nature of the contract really impl implicate then, of course, the, regu the supervisory, the regulatory authorities that are that are um, that would become active here, especially if it's an insurance contract? I mean, so in other words, um, do you see this still playing out in some fashion? And at some point, there it'll settle. There will be a settlement uh, on some characterization, and that will then uh, trigger some regulatory consequences. What's your view on this? I think that's a very important question. Uh, the design of the relationship certainly can impact the regulatory consequences. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, at this stage, uh, uh, the Austrian and also the German uh, financial market regulatory uh, 
uh, agency and an insurance agency don't consider themselves responsible uh, for third party funders, uh, but that may change with a lot of critique hitting them for other cases. Um, and um, I think that uh, one of the reasons is that there is a lot of uncertainty and debate on the real legal nature, but so far they have not taken the view at least in my region of the world, that those are insurance contracts because of the, there is no fixed premium uh, being paid, but there is a percentage of the outcome. Um, and they're not of the opinion that this is a, a, a genuine loan agreement falling under the um, banking and the banking license. It's more uh, the general view here taken that it's more a type of a partnership agreement, uh, which um, is questionable because um, I think there can also be certainly cases, there are certainly cases involved of a bet and of a purchase contract. Okay, thank you. I suggest we, um, we move on, uh, Sergey, to security for costs because we only have about 10 minutes left. Yes, thank you, James. Uh, indeed, we have uh, actually seven minutes and as uh, the organizers told us that at uh, 1.50, yeah, Moscow time, uh, the session will be interrupted. So we also have in the chat uh, an announcement from uh, Victoria, from RAA, that the next Scotto shop starts at uh, 2.10 uh, p.m. Moscow time. So please use the link to join uh, any session you'd like. And uh, then we're moving forward to security for costs. I think one of the uh, cornerstone issue in third party funding uh, field. Uh, so why is it so important and why is it so important, especially during and after Corona times? So basically security for costs, it's a mechanism as you know, as an interim measure uh, to uh, protect the interest basically of the respondent uh, in the case against uh, an adverse cost award. Uh, so when the respondent is claiming money from unsuccessful claimant who lost in arbitration or litigation. And uh, it is especially important when a claimant is funded by a third party, uh, is it an indicator that the claimant will not be able to cover this adverse cost award? or will the funder be able to cover this cost of the respondent in case the claimant loses? Why is it so important during Corona times and uh, also after coronavirus? Uh, because as you know, many proceedings, especially international arbitration proceedings were delayed and they just increased the problems which led to the engagement of the third partner, basically the lack of cash flow and uncertainty where actually this claimant will receive money uh, from the respondent. So what actually happens now, it also happens in our cases, uh, the hearings are delayed, uh, parties submit more and more applications for extension uh, of time for further submissions. Uh, they require more time, you know, to uh, just discuss the submission with, with the co-counsel, with the expert witness, with the client. That's why the process is more and more protracted and prolonged. And um, another issue is uh, how to conduct the hearings, uh, either virtually or in person. And uh, especially, for example, in some cases when the tribunal orders the parties to participate in online hearing, uh, but the parties or uh, one of the parties uh, are not willing to do so, whether this could lead to possible set aside of the award. This all issues create such mess with regard to the uh, certainty when actually claimant gets this money and uh, how it will be paid. And uh, this works the same for the respondent because uh, when the claimant is uh, actually claiming this money and uh, looking for quick cash but cannot obtain it, uh, is it still uh, safe for the respondent to continue these proceedings uh, because it impacts the situation when the claim will be rejected. But finally, all fees and costs which claimant, uh, which respondent spent on this, for example, arbitration to external counsel, arbitration costs and fees, they could not be reimbursed in, uh, in any way. 
So uh, there are different views with regard to uh, whether the corona will lead to the uh, increased amount of applications for security for costs. And the, sometimes they said just that uh, a mere deterioration of the Paris position because of the corona times without actually rendering it uh, impecunious uh, does not justify the security for costs award because uh, all parties are under the same circumstances, either private investors, for example, or state parties in investment arbitration. But uh, sometimes what can actually happen when especially the claimant was funded from the very beginning, from the outset of the arbitration, and then, for example, the funder could not just maintain the cash flow to, to this particular case, or the funder could just leave this case uh, could actually make uh, the case worse for the claimant and actually uh, as a consequence worse for, for the respondent because finally uh, it will not be uh, avail it, it will not it, it, it will not just reimburse this cost. So uh, the general principles which were uh, stated in the ICA and Queen uh, Mary University report uh, can still apply here that uh, a mere participation of the funder does not justify security for cost award and the, it, it has to be specific evidence that uh, the claimant uh, or, or some other so some party will not be able to meet an adverse cost award also because there has been a material and unforeseeable change in its position since the inception of the arbitration agreement. So James, uh, Nikolaus, what, what do you think, whether we'll see the increased number of applications and how tribunals could, could deal with it? Uh, Nikolaus, you want to go ahead? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. Um, you were called first, so let's <laughs> wait. Um, <laughs> a bit, but, um, what, what we um, see and, is, uh, and expect further is that there will be a change in uh, in case law right now. The, what we see is that the or in the past uh, tribunals and, and case law was extremely restrictive. As Sergey mentioned, in avoiding security for cost, uh, the requirement was that the party was impecunious. But now, uh, with two major uncertainties coming up, which uh, Sergey addressed, which are the length of the proceedings, um, if there are no um, virtual hearings and that uh, many cases are is a big point of debate and the uh, question of uh, financial impact of the COVID crisis um, there is a new um, very strong argument which um, can be raised we haven't seen any decision yet on which I can report but uh, this is definitely a new topic and something to take into consideration as a result of the COVID situation. Okay, just briefly, because I know Victoria needs to move on, but um, we, um, we haven't fortunately seen that many delays, so it's, we've actually been able to, to handle our existing cases uh, quite well. Um, but I, I could see what, what Nicolas has mentioned, especially because at least in some countries you have insolvency laws that have been effectively, effectively put on hold. And so you have what they call zombie companies walking around that you don't actually know whether they're impecunious or not. And so... Uh, yes, I could see many more applications being done in this respect um, and also perhaps as a result of the disclosure requirements because if you don't know to ask about something, you're not going to ask. But with the new disclosure requirements like in the new ICC rules that will come into effect next year and other arbitration institutions, I think parties will simply have now the basis to actually ask uh, where before they may not have done because they weren't aware of the funding. Thank you, Nikolaus. Thank you, James, and we are moving uh, basically to the conclusion of our session. And I would like just to share with you in chat uh, the two, uh, two links uh, to the, the recent documents, which are uh, very relevant to uh, our practitioners from United States. Uh, first is the uh, ABA best practices for uh, third party litigation funding. It's a voluminous document which uh, discusses the best practices for financing disputes, both from commercial side and consumer litigation funding. Uh, there are some critiques with regard to this document, but basically it provides one of the most 
current and uh, reliable guidelines with, with regard to organization of uh, involvement of third party funder. And the second document is the uh, report of the working group uh, from the New York City Bar Association. So working group on litigation funding prepared the report in this February. And uh, it discusses uh, issues which pertains to United States uh, attorneys, for example, with regard to peace splitting with non-lawyers, which is one of uh, the most uh, crucial topic there because uh, professional lawyers, attorneys are not allowed to share any fees with non-lawyers. So it deals with basically change of uh, ethics rules and they also rejected the arguments uh, in favor of uh, mandatory disclosure of funding before the United States courts. So these basically are uh, the most important developments just happened recently in February and in August. Uh, I welcome here any questions which you might have on this topic or some other issues which we discussed before. And uh, if not, let's see. We have a question from Jamal, probably to James, I think, what you started. How funders would consider inflation factor or currency collapse? Uh, or what about even digital currency with regard to third party funding? Um. Well, one of the many funders here in the room should actually <laughs> take up that question. I mean, inflation, uh, I'm sure they, they, they use uh, or they account for inflation the way the companies uh, account for inflation when they project several years into the future. You use a uh, expected and discounted expected rate. But um, I, uh, I would really, in, in terms of electronic currency, I would really like to have someone answer whether that's uh, relevant right now. Maybe just to add from my perspective, uh, what funders do look at is at the ultimate outcome of the proceedings. So funders will definitely now look at the inflation situation uh, because that and they will have a time span of their investment, which is um, why arbitration is uh, popular among funders because arbitration proceedings are typically conducted in a shorter time than court proceedings. Now with a delay, on the horizon of arbitration proceedings and with the inflation uh, becoming a real uh, risk, uh, funders will definitely take that into account when funding a case. It's my, but I'm not a funder also, but I, uh, I think since funders, funders are uh, taking a financial uh, business perspective, there is, uh, I think there is a very strong <laughs> indication that they will and should do so. Thank you, James. Thank you, Nikolaus. I think uh, we run out of time. So I would like to thank our audience, our participants who joined us today. And uh, hopefully you get some, you got some insights how third party funding uh, works nowadays, especially in Corona times. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer any possible inquiries. And thank you, James and Nikolaus, uh, my amazing co-panelists. Thank you, Sergey. A really great moderation, and thank you both for your contributions, Nicolas and Sergey. Appreciate it. Thank you also both, and uh, it was a pleasure. And thank you all for the audience for staying with us uh, for the last fifty minutes, fifty-five minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Have a good day. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the conference.